How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Rules is Written Raw. My name is Matt, otherwise known as Grape Ape, and my lighting is horrible. I've never been able to get my lighting down, but uh, my co-host uh, joining yeah. us. Yep, Stefan Strad over here, known as uh, DM Bad Wrong Fun on a couple of those websites out there. Uh, but today we, we've got, you know, the guest of guests. When you come to talk about MCC, we have Jim Wampler himself. Stefan, oh. we've finally done it. We've finally <laughs> done it. Finally. We've got Jim yeah. on the show. Jim, would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about yourself real quick? Well, hi, I'm Jim Wampler and I'm the main guy to blame. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. The father of Mutant Crawl Classics. Uh, it is a great honor for us to have you on the show. And we want to spend all the time we can diving into these questions and the rules. So we're going to jump right into it if you're ready, Jim. I've been watching the show and loving every minute of it as you've been going through the book. And it's almost, as the questions pile up on the guests, it's almost like Jeopardy. It's like, bam, bam, bam. So, <laughs> All right. Well, Stefan, you want to start ready. From, uh, good. We're, we're going to go back four weeks from now because we didn't get your answers in the show. I didn't have time to put them in. Uh, but we're going to hit you with the episode from two week, four weeks ago, and then two weeks ago, and then we'll get into the other ones. Yeah, we'll see how, how much of that. Why don't they get uh, an artifact check on uh, healer weapons or yeah. healer medical I, devices? See, I, I, I think start, we, we'll, well start we were starting out with, out with the AI discussions, right? What, what's an artificial intelligence in MCC? Uh, basically anything that thinks and talks, broad stroke. I wish I wish I could go back and rewrite some of that given the AI advances that we're going through now. But uh, <laughs> yeah, everything from a, you know, a world dominating or vying for world domination patron AI down to the little personality that's in your laser pistol. Does it, do they have to have a follower to be an AI? Do they have to have or some one AI a... patron? Yeah, that was a good discussion. They've all been good discussions. And I especially uh, Stephen Newton, because he play tested some of it, but pre-publication, he was right on the beam. He knew the right answers. Um, I mean, uh, how do, how does an AI become an, a patron AI the same way a regular dude in DCC becomes a patron being like Cezricon? I mean, he was born, he was a baby, and then he just scaled up his powers until he could vie for, you know, planetary domination, right? Same thing with an AI. They would have to have some physical manifestation, some way to manifest their powers in the world. And then, you know, what's cheaper labor than a bunch of, you know, Neolithic wasteland wanderers? I didn't even think of relating it. <laughs> they're to they're easier to build babies. than robots. You know, That's they build true. themselves. All right. Well, our next question was, how do you make an artificial intelligence recognition check? Hang on. The production assistant likes the headset cord. Nope. What was the question? <laughs> How do you make an AI recognition check? Uh, well, you roll a d20, add your AI uh, re recognition check modifiers, which are many and varied. And the table in the book gives you a good, you know, baseline for things. But I'm all about, you know, player ad player uh, agency and, uh, you know, you can negotiate with me. You've been at my table, you know. I have, I have. It's very pleasurable. Now, if you're a plant, you painted yourself brown flesh tones and put on a suit and a wig and, you know, some kind of glasses, maybe. All right. We get some, we're going to have some, I don't know, planty and stressing up like Elvis or something pretty soon. I yeah. hadn't thought of that before. I mean, you know, it's based, it, it, I'm the, I'm the GM, you're the player. Mm -hmm. It's your job to convince me. If you can be convincing enough, then let's make it a dice roll and go. There are Elvis suits all over the place, you know, especially in New Vegas. Uh, what was our next question, Stefan? Uh, it was about the, you know, after you make that AI recognition check, you know, how to you use the terminology like a PC achieve dominance and mastery. But, you know, I, I think really the, the core of the question was, what do you do? You know, it's successful. How does that go? Is You know, I think my answer was pretty along the lines of like, well, it depends what, you know, what lie you're telling me <laughs> no yeah um, i use dominance and mastery because that's what's in the book jim how do we achieve dominance and mastery over a, over an ai they, those are completely separate things an ai recognition check will just mean it recognizes you as as something it will talk to and then from there on it's all uh, role playing that's why like for the little personal assistants there's a personality table you can decide how smart how cranky how selfish all those ais could be yeah so, you know, uh, to, to enslave or uh, let's be nice to bring on as a, an official NPC, you know, 
that's that's a lot of smooth talking and role playing. And in my world, I, I will try and parse this out as we go forward between what's rules is written and what I intended and what I actually do, because I don't even run my own game rules is written. You've been at my table. Mm-hmm. You're I, I, I immediately co-opted you as, okay, you want to be my uh, assistant DM because you had a bunch of rules memorized. And in the moment at a convention <laughs> game where we've only got four hours to cram it all in, I just want to have fun. So yeah. I, I will, I, I will lay a fair a little. Well, and it's, it's probably been a long, long time. What it, it came out in 2018. I don't know. It's been a long time since you've wrote, written all those uh, rules that in there, you're going to evolve and change and, uh, as you said, you know, you would you would update a couple of things with the advancements in AI. You probably well, have I mean, a couple of other things too. Since it's the title of your show, full respect for rules is written, and that's a that can be a play style of preference. I just didn't grow mm-hmm. up in those times. You know, it, everything you wanted a world, you built it yourself. So it was all do it yourself, and and I imprinted on that. But it, you know, you you and your table want to play however you're having fun is all that matters to me. Yeah, I'll take the temperature True. of a table and and try and hit the middle. <laughs> well, let's dive into the next episode, episode thirty two. And the first question from that episode was, "What type of healing do the MCC healers provide?" We were talking about healers, and I, I think you know, as intended, it was you know they're naturalistic, you know, using herbs, tree sap, you know, bark to make teas and stuff like that. Uh, like Granny Clutcher has mentioned, yeah, like Granny clamp it back in the mountains you know they've got a poultice for everything mm-hmm. and, and so, so is so, that what was intended or was it intended for them well, they to get, have the artifacts of the ancients well it's both they get they're, they're too big or the naturopathy which is so many times a day for so much heal and it goes up the chain as they level up and then they get to go one up the dice chain from everyone else if it's a medical artifact so not just a meta pack but uh rad shots anything they stumble across that's got a medical intent or design Mm -hmm. they go one up the dice chain which my very favorite thing to game out is that means that everybody with a mutation wants to stay the hell away from the healer and the meta pack because if they get overhealed they could start (laughs) losing mutations because the meta pack thinks their diseases or tumors to be removed so that that was one thing we we had a big discussion i don't think we you know quite came to a, a full agreement on is it they go one up on the dice chain for their artifact check or one up on the dice chain for the actual healing die? You know, the yeah, VA I saw that or like, or both. like are, are the Sentinel and the healer the same? And it's the answer is, of course, no one is, you know, into the martial military stuff. So mm-hmm. he goes, he gets his die bonus to identify and then the thing, the, uh, you know, weapons or armor. The healer doesn't get any advantage in identifying that. Um, they just get the advantage in once they understand it, using it. And that could be, I mean, you know, the difference between 3D8 and 3D10 heal out of that meta pack is pretty good. So if they have an artifact where they have to make a uh, artifact check to use it, uh, that's just, just, so they have identified, let's say they've identified it as a medical artifact. They have to make an artifact check to use it. Do they get a bonus on that check to use it or only on the results? They, they, they would get no artifact check bonus except those that they would be otherwise entitled to okay. via class and level and intelligence, I suppose. And then so whatever the okay. healing uh, it administers or whatever effect it does it makes them faster or, uh, you know, have more stamina or agility, then that die gets bumped up. Well, right, the heals go up one one of the die yeah. chain. Um, you know, it, it when it comes to, okay, this is an important artifact check, who wants to do it? Usually the party figures that out. They, you know, who's got the best check bonus? You know, okay, everybody else step back. Yep, yep. Until that uh, guy gets a reputation for rolling a one. Right. Uh, usually it's a shaman. But Stefan, what's our, uh, what's our next push? Uh, we started getting in... Uh, a little bit about the archaic alignments and and what they are i think we kind of forget where we left off because because we had a very full episode we talked a lot about just the whole concept of what they are and how they are kind of that they're the gamma world throwback a little bit they're a replacement for alignment systems so uh no. that's exactly right if that's the conclusion you came to uh in in i imprinted on two games when i was a teenager <laughs> and one was ad and d and the second one was gamma world so in gamma world there were all the 
cryptic alliances. There wasn't a, you know, nine or three point alignment system in Gamma World. And uh, in DCC proper, they're, you know, law neutral and chaos. For uh, MCC, I did away with that part and just made it all social constructs, which actually I think is maybe a little easier to wrap your brain around because people get very tangled in lawful and chaotic. You know, uh, having a cha- ha- your character's chaotic alignment is not an excuse for you to be a jerk at the table. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's definitely a whole lot of, uh, I don't know, those conversations will never end online. <laughs> or being a lawful paladin, right? That's no excuse for being an asshole. Yeah. Um, but I think we, we, talk, and, 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 we get and, to talk and, about and, the Clan and, of Cog? Or? We skipped the Clan of the Cog, and we're going to talk about that this episode. But we did talk about the Holy Medicinal Order. And, you know, there's there's some information in there that the healers can join the Holy Medicinal Order. There's other information in there that says they're only NPCs. And if they did join the Holy Medicinal Order, they can't attack anymore. Is that is that how you see it, Jim? Yeah, I mean, you know, with everything comes with a price tag, right? I mean, if you patron up to one of those AIs, they're going to be asking you to do all kinds of things. Uh, the intention was that that's a future alignment. Everybody's in what I suggest in the rules and what I run in my own campaigns, everybody starts as clan of cog. Cause that's just a nice, it gives you the excuse. It's the clan of cognition it respects anything that walks, talks and uses tools. That gives you an excuse to mush together a bunch of mutant plants and animals and humans. Right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that, but you know, uh, there's nothing saying a player couldn't a mutant player couldn't go off and join a children of the glow or something. And so the, uh, the HMO was there for healers to aspire to if they really want to heal and they don't want to get in any more combat. And uh, on a very flimsy springboard, Harley wrote a wonderful uh, module all about that, where the, the Holy Medicine Order guys are the bad guys, but that gives the players an opportunity to go in there and fix it. And maybe, you know, what does every player think after they get to the end of the dungeon? We're going to take this place over. It's our new headquarters. <laughs> Well, you know, they're not supposed to be able to strike the Holy Medicinal Order. That's a that's a great sin to do that. So uh, I don't, I'm going to have to play that Harley module. I have not played that one yet. I believe that Blessings of the Vile Brotherhood, if I recall right. Ah, I, yeah, yeah the, the, the Holy Medicinal Order sends you in to go get them and watch out for the Warbot because it's an unkind creature. Yeah, so yeah, there, there's a mix between the Vile Brotherhood and the Holy Medicinal Order. It's a, it's a great, very uh, factional one. I read that a couple of years ago. That Vile Brotherhood is straight out of Sterling Lanier's Hero's Journey. Best I could do. All right, <laughs> well, we finished up all our episodes on the Pure Strain Human classes, so we're about to dive into the Plantient, Manimal, and Mutant classes. So our first question for you, Elaine, if you could bring up question one for Jim. Uh, is what is metagenesis? Uh, can you describe or explain what metagenesis is? It's uh, it's several things. From a rules as written perspective, it's an excuse for zero level mutants not to have any mutations except for ones that don't affect gameplay. So you get through your character funnel, and then what? Well, uh, a, a, a kind, sort of kind lift from the uh, theory of where your mutant powers come from in X-Men comics is the stresses of adolescence will often trigger your mutations. So in the game lore of MCC, going through that first adventure, you know, you get all hot and sweaty and your genomes twist and bang, suddenly you got wings at well, first I- level. Yeah, I mean, not only in X Men, but in a lot of movies. Once the, you know the main character reaches a certain stress point, and they're put under these extreme circumstances, then you know hidden powers are always activated, and you know uh, evolutionarily finding... that makes some kind of legitimate sense because, like in the boys, when they find out Vought's been dosing babies, and, and you know Butcher runs around with a baby mm-hmm. shooting laser beams, a baby born <laughs> with mutations and powers is problematic. You probably would mm-hmm. eventually weed that genetic you know, thing out. Yeah. Stefan, what are your thoughts? Have you ever put metagenesis in your campaign or, or games after a funnel? Uh, I mean, people have certainly gained mutations, uh, but, but it's usually by, you know, going and diving into the goop or uh, rolling, rolling ones or twenties on, on fortitude saves uh, related to, you know, radioactive substances I, I feel like there's like a whole kind of like one-on-one module there where you could have your mutant manimal or plantient go off and experience this metagenesis. You know, they don't want to do it in front of everybody, you know, grow wings out of their back and stuff like mm-hmm. that. 
uh, you know, might be, uh, well, might have to talk well, to James Ponzinello. Yeah, yeah, tell him write that House of the, the Radioactive Red Doors. Exactly. House of the Radioactive Red Doors. That is outstanding. Well, That's Elena, a good title. Can... It is a good title. Uh, Elena, to back up what Jim says, if you could bring up handout 1A for our viewers here. On page 42, it says, when a mutant, animal, or plantian player achieves level one, he or she undergoes the metagenesis, which traditionally marks the mutant's ascension into full adulthood in tribal societies. Uh, handout 1B further states on page 34, if we go back a little bit, all mutants are born with at least one visible mutation. And upon exiting adolescence, they commonly experience metagenesis as their genetic code fully blossoms and the mutant develops an additional number of random mutations. Jim, does that mean when they're all at funnel level, they're in that adolescent state? Or could you have an older mutant plant, plantian or manimal that develops those things later on? I mean, well, okay. Yeah, you've just made me think of something I never had to think all the way through. Obviously, back in the village, there are going to be a few level zeros who never succeeded or went on a rite of passage, a handful at least, that would then just be adult level zeros. Mm -hmm. And uh, rules as written, those poor guys are just running around with purple orange spotted skin or little tiny horns that can't do any damage. Yeah, they've, they've been in their mom's basement all this time and, you know, they got to get out <laughs> one day. The metagenesis doesn't have to happen at a certain age, though. Can and those older guys go once to a funnel and, and get the metagenesis? I would run it that way, sure. Yeah. They're just late bloomers. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. You're, you're making me want to write stuff. Somebody else should write it. I, I'm I mean, slow, but, uh, yeah. but like a whole adventure for little like incel mutants that haven't <laughs> ever gotten there. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that I get so many ideas and I want to write them all down. I just can't do it all. But so, you know, I they, hope somebody listens. If they to suddenly... Thing you know grow the uh reproductive or organs to desire to go out and take their chances in the wilderness and bring back an artifact why should they get chipped they should do it exactly yeah. well elaine if you could bring up handout 1c for us page 42 describes the metagenesis as being a genetic reaction to environmental stress uh, example is combat placed upon a zero level mutated character causing the latent potential of that character's mutant dna to suddenly and fully express itself the result is a number of new mutations which spontaneously blossom. The number type and nature of these mutations vary by genotype. Um, and then we're going to go to the last handout for this question. Wait, wasn't that a lovely way of saying go to page, you know, 74 and <laughs> roll according to your class on, on the table? It was very it's well easy written. easy peasy. Very well written. Handout 1D, Elena, on page 280. In any event, surviving PCs will have garnered enough experience points by completing the adventure to progress to first level. For mutant animal and plant, for mutant animal and plantian PCs, this means undergoing a metagenesis and gaining numerous mutations and class powers. For pure strain humans, this means selecting a class. So the pure strain humans don't get experience metagenesis, but that doesn't mean they're without mutations, right, Jim? Oh, pure strain humans, by definition, can't mutate. That's their thing. They're, they're And the 10,000 years has just hardened their genomes, so it's mutation resistant. But that means they have one mutation, which is mutation resistance, which you wrote in the book. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You're quite correct. That, But but it, but it's like in little, you know, whatever the letters are, G-H-A-T concrete in their RNA and DNA. Well, let's, uh, Stefan, let's give our final answers here. What is the metagenesis uh, in your in your uh, final answer? Well, I'm, I'm glad that I've been using the correct analogy for years. And it's it's just like in X-Men when you get really <laughs> stressed out and, uh, and, you know, you go through mutant puberty and get some sweet powers. Uh, and that stress is usually due to the horrific and hilarious events of a funnel. Now, my final answer is I've never really experienced or played the metagenesis and as, as much as i think i will now having dove into it you know i'm going to make it a little thing that happens maybe just a little side paragraph that i send to the player or something like that um if they continue on from zero level to first level in my game but just like everyone asks in dcc how did they get these spell powers how did you know this zero level villager go from being a, you know an adept fighter and stuff like that there that question is asked in dcc a lot and there's a wealth of information right here for the metagenesis uh, for the mutants, plantians, and animals for people to create content for. 
Uh, but it is when you go from zero level to first level. Jim, what's you're your exactly final? right. It's all it's all just smoke and mirrors to cover up the fact that level zero you don't get any class abilities, but magically at you know ten XP you you suddenly get them. Although right. I like DCC's way of preferring to let's play it out. I want a magic ring. Is there a magic ring store? Well, no. But here's a whole Michael Curse adventure for how you can go, you know, have an entire adventure campaign to maybe get a magic ring. I like I like that. Stefan, uh, why don't you hit Jim with our next question? Absolutely. So the next one we're doing is uh, what different types of mutations are there? Uh, and I don't I don't think we mean uh, go and read us off your, you know, D100 lists. Uh, I mean, like I if we, yeah, if yeah, we've got we like a brand new answer. player, if we got like a brand new player watching, they're like, what are they talking about? People have mutations. What what mutations can a mutant animal or plant eat? There, there are five types of mutations, and they come in two categories. You've got physical mutations, mental mutations, physical mega mutations, mental mega mutations, and defects. And those five types will split into one of two categories, active or passive. Passive is just something that happened to you once, although you, in the rules, have the opportunity every time you level up to fiddle with it, with a dice roll if you want to. Like, so you've got stone skin or you've got wings. Well, those don't, those are passive. They're always there. And then, you know, the more blasty powers are active. Um, so that's it, you know, physical, mental, mega, physical, mental, and defects. Now, it doesn't say too much specifically about the mega mutations. You kind of kind of discover that for yourself. But, Elaine, if you could bring up handout 2A, it does describe the three that Jim said. Uh, page 42, there are three types of mutations that player characters may have in MCC. Physical mutations, mental mutations, and defects. Among all the mutations, there are two subcategories, active and passive. And then once you roll that high, super high amount, the 98 to 100, then you get the mega mutation chart, which I, I've never got a mega mutation yet, but I'm still holding out. Uh, Jim, what, why did, was it important to put defects in there? Is it just to kind of stabilize a little bit? Well, okay. So I, I think it was when Steve Newton was on, but there's a really good discussion that you guys arrived at at a group like, wait, wait, wait a minute. You can't take, you know, MCC comes in after DCC. Well, the bones have got to be the same or it's not DCC anymore, but things have, they can't be exactly right. You know, a warrior can't be a sentinel, a shaman can't be a wizard. Exactly. You've got to be differences or else why are you playing it? So the mutations are, and the mutations and artifact check are the my two favorite things from Gamma World. The things that were the most fun was just picking up those percentile dice, taking a shot and seeing what mutations you got. It's just uproarious fun every single time. And, oh, you rolled high. Well, now you get two or you get a mega. Or, no, you rolled like, oh, one. Uh, whoops, you got a defect. So uh, it was all an homage to that. And uh, the uh, artifact check was the same thing, except in Gamble World. It was this crazy flow chart that was super fun to roll around on, but took an enormous amount of time. So I just recodified that as a D20 table. Now, what was the question? I forgot the question. <laughs> well, I said, why was it important to put defects in there? Does that kind of balance these crazy mutated powers that uh, they're having? The, well, yeah, I mean, defects are balance. Radburn and the defects that can sometimes result from that are a MCC little bit different version of uh, uh, not uh, spell corruption. corruption. Spell corruption. Yeah. All right. Right. So your character, if you've got a mutated character, there are little mini spellcasters anyway, right? Because the tables for the active yeah. mutations are the same as spells. So, you know, with all that mut mutating around and radiation everywhere, uh, fecal matter happens, you know? <laughs> all right. Well, Lane, if you could bring up handout 2AB, I mislabeled that one. On page 19, it talks about zero-level mutants, manimals, and plantians beginning with only cosmetic mutations. Uh, so, you know, they're going to have the pink purple dot skins, you know, the third arm, stuff like that. Additional mutations for these classes manifest at first level and are rolled for separately at that time. Jim, was there ever any thought for those physical visual mutations being applied directly to uh, active mutations, like power mutation, I guess? Because at zero level, you have something, you could have like four arms, right? But you don't get two attacks. 
Right, right, because in the meta fiction of the game, the additional two arms are just real tiny. And no, I didn't write in anything where that gave you a bump to actually growing the two attack full forearm mutation. It's all very random, which is both in the spirit of the game. But that doesn't yeah. mean somebody else can't write something like that. That would be an excellent article. I, You know, if somebody submitted an article like that for Scientific Barbarian, I'd run it. There you go. Uh, anybody wants to submit a sidebar, there you have it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've oh. done no more or less than, uh, you know, uh, uh, draft, like in racing, we use a draft behind the car that's winning, you know, draft Joe Goodman in a lot of this because uh, the whole thing with DCC is uh, Joe's genius application of third-party uh, publications and the support they bring. I mean, that's why, you know, a normal RPG lifetime will be like, four or five years and everybody's off to something else that didn't happen with dcc and i'm now discovering i i kind of drafted into that with mcc too because the third party support is where all the groovy stuff happens because nobody invents anything revolutionary sitting in a corner doing what they're supposed to do if you ever noticed the world kind of works that way it's always some crazy guy off in a corner you know at, at his day job invents something good that wasn't what he was hired to do that's what third party products do well, we let's talk a little bit more about active and passive mutations. Uh, and so handout 2C, if you could bring that up, Elena. Page 42 says active mutations are generally those mutations that act as at-will powers. Mutation check rolls for at-will active mutations are rolled each time the mutation is used. So this is like something they're going to physically have to think through. Um, it's not something that's just going to be happening around them. They're going to have to, they're going to want to will it. Yes, interestingly, yeah. very similar to the discussion you had where as a, a guy who I'm guessing must have played a rover at some point, you wanted the rover stealth ability to be passive versus <laughs> at will, right? I'm telling you, that, makes, you were, that sounds good you, to me. You were making good arguments for it, but uh, rules is written, no. And same thing with the mutations. The active ones are, uh, yeah. you know, okay, I want to turn invisible. I'm not walking around invisible. I want to shoot lightning, you know. I want to. I want to mind control that guy right there. And so, Stefan, the passive mutations, Elena, if you could bring up handout two D, uh, page forty two, passive mutations are those that tend to have permanent and lasting effects upon the character. Yeah. Mutated mutation checks for passive mutations are only rolled when they're first acquired, and may be optionally re-rolled anew at each level progression. So the distinction there is. Do we have to roll a mutation check the first time we get an active mutation? Kind of like learning a spell. Well, with all the mutate, yeah, yes, yes, yes. You, okay. you would okay. You've got multi arm. Okay. Well, that's not necessarily four. That could be all kinds of things. So you roll on the table as you get your first, you know, at first level. And if you're smart, you you burn some luck. Or uh, player actually asked me, "Can I can I glow burn to roll the mutation?" And I'm like, sure, go for it. And well, you can stock up some luck, you know, and if you and then you could still tank it with a one. So okay, second level, yep. you do it all over again and, and burn the crap out of your luck and get a good result. So for and, an and you're gonna have to mutation. you know suffer through a you know, whatever the follow up adventure is with your glow burned self, you know. Well, you so it it's just there. like spells too. You might be yeah, doing right. that and suddenly you've got, you know, a thirty two plus result, which you did not want. You know, so, I don't. I don't need a mutant with fourteen legs and twenty arms. So, Jim, let's say they go from zero level to first level. They gain their mutations. They roll the dice. I got this mutation right here with four arms. Do I have to be successful with that mutation to be able to use it for first level? Because when you advance to first level in DCC and you gain a new spell, you have to cast that spell successfully to be able to get it, to be able to learn it. With active mutations, yes, but passive ones, no. One say say you say you're the cat that got four arms and two attacks now. Okay, you've got if if you're happy with that, you've got it forever because it's a passive mutation. If your yeah. skin is you know shiny impenetrable steel and it up your armor class, if you're happy with that, you have it forever. You don't have to keep rolling every time you know something hits you. So and, and if you get like that ten, that's a failure. You can just well, you know, it's a cosmetic, uh, and when you level up again, you can try to make it more than cosmetic, and your carapace mutation will actually do something at that point. For the active mutations, can they re-roll that as many times as they want during whatever level to try to succeed, or can it only be during level progression? 
Well, active uh, active mutations don't get that same privilege because yeah. they're at will power. So you know, you, you, as many times. you roll your die and you take your shot. I think I was always. Uh, I was probably confusing our viewers with my questions, so I just wanted to clarify that out there. It's okay. I mean, if you've got the question, hundreds of millions of players have it, or whatever, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go on to defects. Handout two E. Yeah. If you could bring that up, Elena. Defects are harmful and unpleasant mutations of a generally disadvantageous nature uh is there any good defect out there i haven't read them all and i know they scale just like a spell except in reverse because the, rolling higher is still better so the higher you roll on the defect the less impactful the defect is so right. you might want to rad burn or i mean sorry i'm mm -hmm. glow burn or use luck to get a higher defect because it'll be less impactful yeah, some of them, if you get to that 20-plus result, it's actually good. Um, not all, but th there's a few. And and if I did my job right, they're all written to be, you know, golden roleplay opportunities. Well, I wanted to include this last handout, and this is from the foreword of Mutant Crawl Classics itself. Elaine, if you could bring up handout 2F, when we're talking about mutations, the foreword by James Ward uh, that, that he wrote for you, Jim, in the 1970s, when I made the apoc my Apocalypse game, I added mutations of many types. Jim Warbler's version does the same, but its mutations are described in stunning detail, leaving no doubt as to what the mutation does. In the 35 years of post-apocalyptic game design, one would think that no possible new mutation idea was there to be explored. This game breaks new ground in mutations and it adds a power level other games couldn't manage. Does that mean there's no more room for new mutations? Did we get them all? Well, hey, James M. Ward was very kind and all that. So, you know, thank you for that. Uh, your mileage may vary. And of course not. I, I mean, my God, there was when uh, when Goodman Games did the uh, first big coffee table reprint of Metamorphosis Alpha, there was a bunch of extra stuff that came with that. And some of it, I, w I was still working at Goodman Games then. Some of it was a pylon. There's one called the Mutation Booklet. You can find it on eBay and it's probably going to only be 10 or 20 bucks. And it's hundreds and hundreds of mutations um sometimes for scientific Ooh. barbarian i'll just do a bookmark you know that'll have a little mutation table on the back wait, wait go back you're telling me that there's a goodman games mutation booklet out there somewhere yeah yeah saddle stitch in the format of a regular adventure module except those those extras for the old metamorphosis alpha kickstarter were printed with black and white covers best Seven. metamorphosis alpha adventure i ever wrote was called the captain's table and it was just me sticking red dwarf and the metamorphosis alpha <laughs> and one of those was the uh on a bet with tim cass because he didn't like red dwarf how like, you would never make a game out of this i'm like oh yeah well let's see but anyway the mutation manual so what it's called you can go find it on ebay all the time Stefan, do you got that mutation manual? i don't have that one i i don't have a uh, much metamorphosis alpha stuff on my shelf i do have the captain's table but I'm gonna i can't i can't say for it. certain but i would bet my bank account that the pdf is for sale in the goodman games web store too i'm That's sure probably a good uh well let's give our final for answer this for this one so we can get on to the next one what different types of mutations are there uh so there's passive mutations i'm sorry there's uh physical mutations there's mental mutations and there's defects. Uh, so those are the three categories of mutations you got. And then from those branch, you're active and passive. And then if you're really lucky, you get those super godlike mutations. Stefan, what's your final answer? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think I need to really add anything more. We, you, You've got it right as it is. Right, Jim, anything you would like to add on that? Um. Uh explore the third party publication things cuz usually mm -hmm. the monsters have their little a lot of the monsters have their own little mini mutations too and you can you can puff up your mutation list with that too the uh did you ever get a player mm -hmm. in your games jim that had any mega mutations uh i con games yes in the original campaign no i'm i'm dying to try out one of those mega mutations are they are they overpowered when somebody gets one or well, they're all OP if you roll 32 plus, right? That's true. That's, That's the true. way it's built. But, um, you know, they're just bigger and shinier. I don't, I, I, I would have to look it up to go down the <laughs> list and even come up with one right here. Dave, 
there's a pretty like wide variety in what they can do. I think one is like detonating fingers and you shoot little rockets off of your fingers and it's, it's an absolutely killer thing. And another is like you can enter like a, you know, comatose state and it's meditative state. That's what it's called. And so it's like not related to combat at all. Yeah, um, one but it can be very helpful to, in a game. Only need to breathe like a tiny bit of nitrogen to survive. Uh, so you basically don't yeah, even have to breathe I, anymore. I, yeah, I think that the highest one is just like, yeah, you're never going to die as long as you just keep on doing this. You can keep on thinking on stuff. Uh, but so the the mega mutations, they've a lot of variety there, as with uh, all the other mutations as well. So if you do get one, make sure you spell burn that and oh, glow, <laughs> glow burn that and use your luck. Uh, but Stefan, what, what's our third question for this episode? Uh, how are mutations determined? All right, so Jim, we know what mutations are out there. We know the metagenesis happens that causes them, but I'm a brand new Z player, first time I ever played this funnel. How do I get those mutations? Uh, you uh, try and uh, entreat the random forces of uh, nature. <laughs> you know, Lady Hope, Lady Fortune's got your back, and pick up the percentile dice and roll it randomly on that table. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Lane, if you could bring up handout 3A for us. On page 42, it gives us a breakdown. It says, upon achieving first level, each genotype has a different possible number of random mutations, uh, random physical and mental mutations that they can possess. Uh, and there is a handy-dandy little chart for that. After determining the number of mutations they get and type for a character by their genotype, uh, roll 1D100 for each mutation using the appropriate column from the mutations table. And then look up the relevant mutation and roll for that specific manifestation of that mutation. Note that while two mutants may have the same mutation, that mutation can manifest itself in completely different ways, uh, which is, I, I think, a callback to DCC, right? Because each spell can manifest. Right, right. It's, it's just me backdrafting the genius of the Dark Master. You know, all those, that's how, you know, my magic missile spell might be eagle claws flying through the airs, and yours might be, you know, force ghost kittens. <laughs> right. So, Elaine, if you could bring up handout 3B for us, this is the table once we've determined. And Stefan, I don't have my rules handy, but like I think a planty gets two physical and one mental, and a yeah, animal it's... gets three physical and two mental. Oh, plantains don't get any mental. They get yeah. no mental. Yeah, they're yeah, screwed they're... that way. All physical stuff, but yeah, um, yeah, it depends your your number. It's you know, it's I think basically a die roll for each of the classes. So you look at the class and see how many times you get to roll on uh, table three one to determine what type of or thing you're getting I believe so that's the order if if we had a mutant let's see let me bring up my rules here real quick uh you're gonna make me many... do i had this just in case you made me so <laughs> i mean we need to go through it just in case we got a, a brand new player out there yeah i had it open to me so i'm looking at a man yeah, mutant in general mutant humans get the most and then mutant animals so a like man one or two less of each like a manimal would get 1d2 random physical mutations and one random mental mutation. So, so they're just going to default roll on that table. The table we just showed, 3, 1, that'll be in the future whenever they might get in a situation where they're going to gain a mutation. You know, they, they dive into the, the pool of radioactive ooze. They roll a 1 on their fortitude save. And, uh, you know, they're getting messed up by the ooze, but they're also going to get a mutation out of it. As, or they catch some rat burn by tanking a roll. Yep. Or, or they find one of those uh, cor cortexin cylinders uh, and, and you know, go go huffing that so they can get some some new stuff. Yeah. There is so, one of those on the character sheet of every set of pregens I hand out at a convention, except on the character sheet, it just says <laughs> monkey head symbol uh, tube. <laughs> and I cannot get anybody to play with it. I want All somebody right, well, to set that thing off in a crowded room full of just like regular plants and animals. And now their situation is much more interesting. Well, you, now you, you now guys you heard it here. People, yeah, now you won't get people to stop messing around with it. All right, so but for a mutant, though, let's focus here. We can roll 1d3, and that determines how many physical mutations we get. And we roll a d2, flip a coin, and that determines how many mental mutations we get. Mm -hmm. Jim, can we use luck to bring that up? If I roll a 1d3 and get a 1, can I burn 2 luck to make it a 3? Oh, not rules as written. No. Oh. Always blocking my, always blocking my godhood. You're always these, these well, rule creators. The always... Your... I didn't pick the name of your show. 
No. Um, All right. I mean, the, you run if you and your group. If that's the the uh, house rule, go for it. See what happens. All right. It's going to be a wild time. Also, if uh, if folks out there are are really in need of uh, you know, we've got those one D twos. You can go on Mud Puppy games.com and buy yourself an officially branded scientific barbarian 1d2 death die it's a there it's a metal go. coin yeah it comes right. with its own rules but uh thank you for the plug i just went and casted a bunch of those last week cool. all right well so once i let's say i'm a mutant i rolled 1d3 i got a one i rolled 1d2 i got a two uh so i get one physical i rolled the one the d20 then so i'm rolling on table three one and if it's a one or a two that mutation is a mutation. It's a it's a defect instead. Uh, well, but then, okay, rules is right? written. You can you can push that with both luck and I have allowed glow burn. So okay. At first level, you technically don't have glow burn until you've got the mutations. But you know, so what? The shaman can glow burn. You should be able to too. But you can never, you know, the rules the same as DCC. You can't do anything about a one. If you right. if you a one a one or, a one is always a fumble and a twenty is always a critical hit. So if you do get a two though, the two with that we can push with luck to make it a regular mutation. If you get a I one, would rule that way, stuck. yes. All right. Yeah. Uh and then you know, if you're looking on chart three one, three through thirteen, you physical mutation, fourteen through twenty, mental mutation. Um, so why do we have this? Oh, that's for Radburn results. I am looking at the wrong table here. Uh, so we were going to talk more about Radburn in our next episode, but Elena, let's bring up our mutation chart. If you could bring up handout 3C for us, here is our D100 mutation chart. And so after I've rolled my D3, I've rolled one physical mutation, I roll a D100 here, and I get plasticity. Everyone always seems to get plasticity in my game. Then... Uh, that is going to be, an act, I think that's a passive one. And so they're going to roll to see how plastic their body parts are. Uh, if you get down to 98 to 100, that's when you get the big, huge mega mutations. Mm. And conversely, you know, if you roll a one through five, you're getting a defect. Now, Jim, you're saying we can use luck to bump this on this D100 roll. If I didn't want plasticity. Oh, I not on the D100 roll. No, no. I thought you meant. When you on, on the red burn result. mutation or did, red burn result. Yeah. yeah so i'm mm -hmm. switching it now can i use luck on this d100 rule uh i mean no but uh not rules is written but you know what it's it's you and your four you know gaming buddies that have played different games and campaigns for 20 years and you decide you want to just sit down and pick your mutations i don't care have fun you, right. you heard it here. No Pinkertons coming from, from the Wampler house. Stefan, that means, <laughs> that means I get to pick my mutations the next game that you run. Oh, all right, all right. We'll see about that. All right. Well, we've got one more handout for this question. Lane, if you could bring up handout 3D for us. Uh, here is your list of godlike mega mutations. Uh, phase shift, xenomorph, uh, life force drain. So many good ones on there that I've never gotten to experience. If you could just see the little, you know, peanut elephant circus song carousel in my head, as you're rattling those off, my head is just going, okay, you know, uh, blasting fingers. That's Blastar from Fantastic Four, Phase Shift. Okay, that's the vision from the Avengers. All these things in my head, wh where they started. Yeah, well, th and that's what we want to find out. We want to find out what your brain is thinking when you made all this stuff. Deal skin. That. that was that was uh, Ben Boxer, Commandy's buddy, right? Who could just go <laughs> touch his little fusion thing and go poof and turn to steel. All right. Well, let's give our rules written. Uh, Stefan, why don't you go first? How are mutations determined? Uh, if at first level you just follow the the thing that it says in the class, you roll one d two or one d three, what have you. Um, later, you you. Uh, determine them, you know, in the circumstance where you get them by looking at, uh, you know, your Radburn result table, which is just you're going to roll a d20, flat d20 roll, unless you decide to, uh, well, I guess, burn, glow burn a little bit, of, uh, apparently cool, or you uh, burn a little luck, uh, you know, maybe to get up into a mental mutation category or at least get out of a defect category. All right, and my answer is going to be close to the same. Uh, if you're a manimal, plantient, or mutant, you're going to look at your mutations category under your class description. It's going to tell you what dice of how many physical mental mutations you get. You're going to roll a D100. Uh, if it's an active mutation, 
then you're going to be able to roll that whenever you want to activate it. If it's a passive mutation, you're going to roll it once and keep it at least until you level up where you can try to re-roll it again. Uh, Jim, what do did we get? Did we miss anything? What, what's your final answer? No, I think you got it. And and what I've loved about all these little MCC episodes is I don't think I understood how many people out in the general public were getting. Uh, I, I may have written a game that has to be taught a little bit like D and D used to be because there's like the pushback of you know, and I've seen it online. Shamans are not as good as wizards. Well, you know. A shaman with a patron AI and a laser rifle, you know, and a bunch of stuff in his pack, and he heals back his luck, which a wizard doesn't, is certainly as good as a wizard, right? But you have to play it, rules as written first, and figure that all out, which is, we had to do with DCC. When we started playing DCC, we played it so wrong, we depopulated our home <laughs> village of level zeros by like 25%. We were going back from Sailor's Star to Sea. Okay, now we just need more. There were no more 50 foot of rope that we had because all the hemp rope guys were dead. We killed them, running them out in the middle of that thing and the octopus would eat them. You know, just just play, play through it. Rules is written and you'll discover things. And you've been, that's been the theme, I think, of all these shows, which is fantastic. I love it. I, well, I, I love MCC for for getting me to have that that laser rifle carrying wizard type guy. I, ever since I saw the cover of Temple of the Frog, I was going, I want that. Well, you just articulated my sweet spot. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, an <laughs> AD and D magic user that's been cross dimension and has got some particle beam weapon on him. Well, now we're going to get to my favorite question of the episode. I, I've been waiting for this one, uh, Lane. If you could bring up question four for us. Jim, who are the clan of the Kong? They were written to be the, I mean, who are they in the game or? Well, who are, are they, they in the rule book? Who are they in your mind? Who are they intended to be? I, I want it all. Um, I mean, they're, uh, they're kind of the guys in the Star Trek episode, the Apple, both while they were under the control of Val and then later do you know the one i mean where everybody was like kind of a, a orange skin tone with little the and the leader guy had knob antennas so he could talk to their ai patron i you know i was the next I'm, generation kind of guy so i only saw I'm a sorry. few of the okay. star trek episodes the, 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 the words clan of cog are corruption of the proper <laughs> name that only the elders and shamans you know the inner mysteries know is the clan of cognition so they're just a a, a, a group of uh, you know, Neolithic jungle dwelling tribes, people who can't read, can't write, can't farm, you know, everything's made out of stone bark or leather have philosophically decided if it walks, if it talks, if it can use tools, it's worthy of at least mutual respect. Uh, normally at a con game with new MCC players, I go, you know, I have to add in, that doesn't make you a goody two shoes tribe. If somebody tries to murder you, you go murder them right back. But you know, if, if something is friendly and it talks, okay, you're at least going to talk back to it. Ad advantageously, that will work with smart metal, although the smart move with smart metal is stay the hell away from it. Uh, Lane, if you could bring up handout 4A for us, uh, I'm not even going to repeat it because Jim just said exactly what the description in the book is. Uh, but after that, if you could bring up handout 4B uh, on page 144, it talks about the qualifications. Membership is only open to any like-believing, pure strain human, manimal, uh, plantian, or mutant. The benefits that you get from being in a clan is safe passage through the territories controlled by its members and a right to invoke clan hospitality with other clan members and tribes. And then, of course, the secret sign, a circle traced upon the forehead. Oh, I did the wrong one. Sorry, that's somebody else. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, they're not going to let you in anymore. So, I mean, I've never used this in game, but I, I trust me, it's on my list to do it. Like whenever we're talking to an elder or whenever, like when you, when you start up on the Mesa uh, and you got to go over to the Hawk people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what module is that? Uh, uh, seeking the post humans. Seeking the post humans. Brandon LaSalle joint. And you, you go over to the Hawk people and the Hawk people really don't like you or, the, you know, you know, the, I should have, the first thing I should have done is give them the circle and say, do you welcome me? I want to call upon the clan of the cog, you know, welcome, invite me into your tribe, you know, because they were kind of a little standoffish. I'm going to use this in an upcoming game that I play. It's a rough, full jungle. It's a jungle out there, but, you know, 
not everybody wants to be a murder hobo as dear as murder hobos are to my little gamer <laughs> heart. Well, we're going to talk more about archaic alignments because I believe there's a huge depth there in upcoming oh, episodes. Yeah. But page 22. Uh, Elaine, if you could bring a hand out for C for us, please. Page 22, all zero-level genotypes may begin as members of the Clan of the Kong. And it goes on to say that they can be other members, but they can at least join the Clan of the Kong. Now, some of this wording kind of insinuates that there may be other members out there, pure strain humans, plantings, mammals, mutants, that aren't part of a clan. Is that true, Jim? Well, right. I'll, it's just not to jam anything down to anybody's throat that you know it's a it, rules is written at mutant Croc classics you have to start in the clan of cog well that would be complete bullshit so you know there are all the other archaic alignments and how do i know maybe you want to maybe you don't just want to play a murder hobo campaign maybe you want to play a, a a a evil you know campaign or you know the post-apocalyptic version of the boys that's fine go for it you know have 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 your starting out party be all children of the glow and just be all about the radiation and screw those pure yeah. strain human guys. Now, Elena, if you could bring up handout 4E for us. We're going to skip to 4E and then go back to 4D. This is a map of Terra AD. Uh, and Jim, this is in the very, uh, the end cover sheets of the uh, MCC, but I, where is the clan of the cog in this map? Are we all over all of Terra AD? Um. I, I imagine I'm going to so struggle, struggle answering this in a way that doesn't cause problems. Well, um, before you answer it, before you answer it, let me bring up handout 4D because on page 266 for assault and typo of the Sky High Tower, it does a little paragraph like an intro paragraph. If you're from a tribe known as the Clan of the Cog, uh, the Clan of the Cog is comprised of three nearby villages and a swamp, each populated by Neolithic hunter gatherers of each genotype. Uh, and so it kind of says the Clan of the Cog is just in this one place. But is the Clan of the Cog all over Terra AD? Uh, obviously, anything that's an MCC is heavily based on my home campaign where we play tested it all the way up when the rules were only 35 pages long, all the way up to and past publication. The uh, There's there's no rules as written answer to that. Uh, I have a map, uh, both in my head and you know done up nice in Photoshop that we played from that the rules are based upon. Um, but then uh, when it came time to include the map in the book, uh, Doug did what Doug wanted to do, which is great. I mean, it's like a Cezanne painting. Um, it's just not labeled because I didn't know where to put – I didn't know how to translate from what's in my head in, in there. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, like so Shatterback Mountain. Me personally, funny. I have a map of the entire continent where all the legit – mcc adventures are little pin drops and you know uh it's hot house jungle from here to here to the northeast it's crater country to the northwest it's radioactive desert if you go out far enough it turns into silver grasslands and then past that is are the the uh broken remnants of the rocky mountains where those hmo got or the vile brotherhood is hanging out you know could we could we see a release of that map in a future episode of sidebar maybe um, it, a version of it is on my web store, so mm -hmm. uh, you know because I don't want I, I don't want to step on anybody's IP. It's not Terra AD; it's Omega Terra. But yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So in, in your mind, let's say you know as far as territory lines go, you know if the clan. I mean, I've continued to write is... adventures, so they're still taking place there, mm -hmm. and you know, and it's fine. You know, it's not everything doesn't have to be. You know, it's no different than third-party publications. I just, you know, I'm doing what I want to do. Are the territories, you know, lined out in your game that you have on your map? Are there certain Clan of the Cog distinctive, like, states or, uh, you know, countries? Yeah, I mean, you, you, if I remember correctly, the game session you played in the last North Texas Con I was at was a big hex crawl that went across was, some of those territories. Was. Yes, and, you know, I could was. show you on my map where that all took place in the little line you went. Um, but here's what I want to say, you know, because in my personal campaign and in my own game designer brain, it's all nailed down. It's not I didn't think it was a job of MCC to nail that all down because I wanted to provide just the through line of a setting. So every uh judge was able to flesh it out their own way intentionally because that's what joseph did with dcc if you recall the earlier 
Dungeon Crawl Classics line, which was just a line of adventure modules through the various editions of D&D at the time, starting back at three and up through four, um, they had a very nailed down setting. There's one big giant box set where you can get a world map of uh, Earth, A-E-R-T-H. And you can see in DCC that it's kind of still that same world, but the uh i mean it's almost a marketing decision the intention of decision was to never nail that down to just let every judge design their own world for themselves and i just i just imitated that as what i thought was the best design choice well before we sense? wrap up yeah it does yeah. make sense but before we wrap up jim i've got one more handout for you handout for Ethelina, page 144 it says shamans of this order. This is after the description. Shamans of this order are even known to go out in this wild lands in groups of four, one from each genotype, in order to recruit new members or tribes into their ranks. That means they're actively, you know, searching out other non-tribe members that might not have a, a archaic alignment or approaching other archaic alignments. And that is like such a module fodder right here for me that there's four shamans of each genotype you know, like traveling the earth, that should be like a random encounter. And in any module, you run into these four shamans. I mean, you want the deep magic, the HMO, and I forget the name. The I'm going to say the Gam World version, Brotherhood of Thought. What is it? What is what is the one you were just talking about? The uh, well, that's the clan of the Kong, the four shamans at the very end. Oh, of the oh, oh. The, the, right, 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 the right. Curators or. No, no, no. That's at the end of the clan of the Kong description. It says okay. four shamans of each genotype are wandering the earth trying to recruit. Oh, gee, I forgot about that myself. But yeah, <laughs> that, stuff like that and the the Holy Medicinal Order are also there to serve as GM tools in case, you know, after you get fourth, fifth level and everybody's happy, you don't want to TPK them even if they beg you for it. So, you know, oh, hey, here over the hill on his, you know, dinosaur frog rides a uh, Holy Medicinal Order guy who can heal you up. That's That's what they're there for. Well, and I agree. I agree. That should totally be some kind of adventure. Yeah, so hear no, that. Nobody steal my four shaman idea because I'm going to try to write that one. But uh, Jim, uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show this evening. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we hope to have you on again so we can, you know, quiz more in your brain. Um, we do have to wrap it up. Is there anything you want to share with us? What do you have going on? What What secrets can you tell us? Oh, well, first, thank you guys very much for having me on here. As soon as you started doing this, I, I don't think I'd sampled the show before that. I started watching it, and I love what you guys do. And thank you for having me on to, you know, gap my gap about it. Um, me personally, I'm in the middle of shipping the fifth issue of Scientific Barbarian, and uh, I'm about 25% shipped today. In a couple of weeks, I'll have that done, and then look out for issue number six, Kickstarter, because that'll be next. All right. Uh, and that's not I, I say I'm doing it. I just edit and lay out the thing. It's mostly uh, you know, independent creators and writers material and content. And not just for MCC too. I, I'm trying to do two things with scientific barbarian. The one flag is for all post-apocalyptic games, because I'm a fan of almost all of them. And the second flag is for genre mash. Mash fantasy, you know, I like my peanut butter and my chocolate. Mash it all together. Mash it with weird frontiers. Have, yeah, absolutely. You know. All right. Uh Stefan, uh how want to take oh, us out? I, Who do we got coming on after us? After us, I believe it's Crash Course again. We those guys love following us and, and uh they put on a good show too. So all right. Well, I think that's gonna be it. In two weeks' time, we'll see you guys back here on the 19th, where we're gonna have Bob Brinkman uh coming mm -hmm. on in to uh go over past episodes and give his opinions on stuff. Um, Jim, we look forward to having you again. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you for all your uh, tech support and everything. And I think we're we're done, right, Stephen? Absolutely, y'all. Thank you, Elena, for that one good. laugh when somebody's joke finally landed. <laughs> we'll see y'all later. <laughs>